um, when I asked when I asked Rupsi about um, what sort of she wanted me to cover because teaching ethnic studies is potentially a massive sort of thing. Um, she said, you know, it'd be great if you could give sort of a 101 type of survey for everyone of what's possible in the classroom. And so um, the slide deck is available for download. It has hyperlinks. It has all kinds of information in it. Um, so I encourage you to pull that down uh, for your own use during this talk. So we're going to screen share and hopefully not break anything because, you know, sometimes that happens. All right. All right. I think we're good. Let me just move that screen window out of the way. Okay. Um, so where I actually want to start, apparently my slides don't want to change. <laughs> there we go. Um, is with a question actually to you guys about, you know, how do you how do you start by thinking about defining ethnic studies um, and specifically digital ethnic studies? When I think about this question, um, I don't necessarily come at it from a question of what my discipline is. You know, I'm trained as a historian. I come at at it from a position of what the values are that I want in my classroom as a teacher. And so for me, digital ethnic studies is really sort of a statement of our values and positions as individuals and as scholars. Um, so, you know, the way this gets conceptualized, it's anti-racist, it's feminist, it's decolonial, um, and it really tries to implement practices from social justice, disability justice, um, that recognize, you know, how we teach our classes are about issues of selection and bias and institutional support, access to resources and materials, questions and problems of racial hierarchies, the embrace of capitalism, the consequences of colonialism. I'm here in Indiana where colonization, um, you would think had never occurred according to the state. Um, so how we sort of, you know, approach digital ethnic studies for me is really about highlighting examples for you all of what's possible in your classroom. Um, this isn't a prescriptive talk, rather it's more to sort of whet your appetite. So I've chosen examples from out of my book that illustrate for you what instructors across uh, sort of digital ethnic studies and digital history and digital humanities are doing in their classrooms. Um, so importantly, I kind of want to start with, oh, sorry, the digital deluge. Um, one of the first things that I think is pretty overwhelming when we think about digital ethnic studies is just the raw amount of material that's out there. You know, the tide and the and the ocean of it is so huge, you know, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day, 3.7 billion people on the internet, text messages, photos, um, you know, the digitized and the born digital materials, that wave is just giant. Um, and that doesn't include the work that's being done at archives and libraries and museums and governments who are encouraging digitization to provide access to archives and holdings and, and the analog records, the paper records that they are there. Um, so to some extent, part of what makes DEF CON so important at this moment is this is an opportunity for us to talk about how do we teach with all of those materials that are out there? How do we sort of understand digital technologies and the cultural record and the questions of the various communities that we study. So I always like to start with a, a little bit of a foundation. Um, and for me, the foundation of a digital ethnic studies class is always data. Um, this is Jill Walker Retberg. Data is always created in a particular way and presented in a particular way. You know, we hear echoes of this in the work of Miriam Posner, in Rupsi's work, in the, in the work of a lot of digital humanists who are focusing on Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities, Asian American communities. Um, and I like to start in the classroom by talking to my students about how sources have to be contextualized in terms of how they're acquired, how they're analyzed, how they're being interpreted. And that that type of analysis is so important because that's how we understand the meaning of data, the meaning of the source. So for you all, this could be data coming in as quantitative, you know, numbers and census records and whaling logs and probate inventories and sales records and phone directories, but it can also be unstructured. It can be things like um, maps and photographic collections and film collections and sound recordings and you know literary works. All of those things are ripe for using in your classroom. Um, and so we're gonna sort of walk through some of these and talk about how do we approach those records in a way that allows us to really ask the questions that we want to ask with our students. Um, 
so I always like to start by talking about a learning outcome process. Um, and, and for me, when we think about a digital ethnic studies classroom, I always sort of use this equation, learning outcomes equal context plus a method plus some sort of technical proficiency. And by that, I mean, content is sort of our topical concern, right? It's, it's the information students need to learn about the community, about the people, about the event. Um, it's, you know, on a syllabus, this is usually shown as, you know, data sets or readings or reading lists or, you know, course um, like guides and books. Um, these are sort of the raw materials of what you want students to engage with. Uh, for me, that means it can be primary sources, but it can also be secondary material, right? And so oftentimes when I think about context, it's primary and secondary material that sort of comes together to help the students think about the topic that we're going to be exploring. Method, on the other hand, is the analytical process by which they will dig into those things that we've pulled together for the class, right? So um, when we think about methods, we tend to rely on ideas about application and evaluation. So have they learned to use the method in an appropriate way? Can they understand the scope of the method and sort of how it, it's deployed against the material that they're working with? Um, and then the technical proficiency is one that um, a lot of people focus on in their first time out as teachers in digital ethnic studies. You know, do they know how to build a website? Can they make a map? Are they technically proficient in putting data on the internet? Are they proficient in building a digital exhibit? Um, and so technical outcomes sort of allow us to move between context and method, right? So um, we generally write these as statements on our syllabi as uh, skills that they'll gain, right? And universities love to know what practical skills a student will come away with from a class and technical outcomes are often a way that we can sort of talk about that. Um, part of the reason why I like this three-part structure when I think about classes is that it encourages students not to think about getting an A so much as increasing their proficiency in each of these three areas, right? And so what that does is it lets us set learning outcomes on a more individual basis for a student. So for example, a student who's already familiar with HTML and CSS and can put things on the internet might have a more complicated technical proficiency that they have to work towards than a student who's just learning you know, what a server is or, or how to write you know, basic HTML. And so that's part of why I like this sort of three-part method when I design syllabi and I think about my classes is that I can sort of group people and students together in different areas and expertise in the classroom. Because oftentimes when we approach the digital ethnic studies classroom, you're gonna get students with a very wide variety of experiences. Students who may not have ever, you know, looked at a desktop beyond the, the visual interface that they get versus, you know, students who are specialists in computer science or engineering or coding or math or whatever, where they come in and, you know, they really know a lot of basics. And so you sort of have to adjust your course outcomes for them. So part of this is as you think of this three part formula, what you're also doing is deciding what counts as meeting those outcomes. Um, and in digital ethnic studies, I often think that one of the most things, most important things we can do in setting learning outcomes is to be clear with students about whether those learning outcomes are about what happens in the class, in the classroom, or whether it's about meeting the needs of the communities that we are attempting to talk about or attempting to engage with in the course. So oftentimes when I lay out learning outcomes, I will split them between learning outcomes that occur just in the learning in the classroom versus the application of that learning to the communities that we're part of. And that's a really important distinction to have that sort of community engaged piece of work happening. So let's start with method. Um, when you get started in digital ethnic studies and digital humanities, trying to figure out what methods are appropriate and, and what methods exist um, can be one of the most overwhelming things. So when I start talking about methods with new teachers, basically what I say is any analog method you may have used in your own teaching or scholarship before, 
likely has a digital sort of correspondence, right? So if you do ethnography in analog form, there is also digital ethnography as a method. If you do oral history as a form of uh, method, there's also digital oral history. And what those two things do, the sort of movement from analog to digital, is it allows you to introduce questions about what technology does to the method and the outcomes you might have. So for example, if you're doing ethnography and interviews, you know, having students understand what is the difference between recording on a device from the 1980s versus recording from a device today? What is the difference between having a closed recording where it's just a one-on-one -on -one session versus you know, recording a community meeting um, and, and what those sorts of things, what those sorts of things do? So when I start thinking about methods, one of the most important things to know is that we borrow methods from so many different disciplines. And it's important that as you think about the digital methods that you might incorporate in your class to be honest about those methods, where they come from, what they're intended for, and how they can be used and or misused by scholars. So I like to guide people to, um, this used to be Project Bamboo slash the DIRT directory slash all of those things for those of you who've been around in the field a little while. This is um, the TAPOR interface. So TAPOR is a set of research tools of methods to analyze texts. Um, and so you can see they have uh, almost uh, 16 and a half thousand, um, or sorry, 1600 uh, research tools for studying texts. And you literally click on each of those dots and it takes you to that tool. It tells you all about it. It discusses its methods. Um, it's a great starting point because part of what they do is group things together. So do you want to annotate? Do you want to interpret? Do you want to publish? Do you want to search? And by using those categories, you can sort of see what are commonly utilized tools and methods in that particular area. Um, and again, you have links at the bottom of these slides that are live so that you can go see those sites on your own to sort of explore them. Um, it's not just sort of a tap or interface that offers you the potential for methods. It's also things like DH methods pages. So this is the page that um, the Yale University Digital Humanities Lab offers. And you can see they have sort of a categorization of four major methods, text, visual, spatial, and network. And when you click on these individual things, you get taken to sort of a set of tools that they have vetted and that they've talked about. Um, and it sort of guides users to potential methods that might work for their type of analysis. So these are just two examples of places you can go to sort of, you know, look around at methods, sort of see how they're being used, see what's being done, see how they work. Um, and you can pretty much go to all of the lib guides that libraries have, all of the DH centers have similar pages. Um, you can go to reviews in DH, like Rupsi mentioned, we talk about the tools that underlie the projects. And it's just a good way to sort of whet your appetite for what's possible in the field. So let's actually talk about some curriculum. Um, and I wanna start with easing us in. So when you're just getting started thinking about redoing your syllabus or moving into the digital space, a lot of people assume you have to start with redoing your entire syllabus from top to bottom, 100% digital methods, 100% digital projects. And what I say to people is actually, it might make more sense for you to ease yourself in with more individualized exercises. So substituting a digital method for an analog method, substituting a digital assignment for an analog assignment, substituting or augmenting um, something you're doing with them with having them look at a digital project. These are small ways to sort of ease yourself into working with digital humanities and digital methods without you having to 100% commit your entire class to something that you haven't tried and tested before. So here's an example of this. Um, this is the letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King. Um, this example is from a teacher at Judge Memorial High School where they're using a digital tool to annotate uh, the letter from a Birmingham jail. This is the hypothesis tool that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, and you can see along the right-hand side, 
you've got students who've gone in and commented on or engaged with each other about what the source says and how it says it. Um, this example hypothesis substitutes in my classroom for an old school analog method where we literally print out documents. I give them colored markers and highlighters and they highlight, underline, color code, star information um, that enable them to answer the questions that we have, right? Um, and we do this with primary sources, but we also do this with art articles from journals. Um, it's basically a digital way for students to do the annotation exercise and the analysis exercise we do with colored pencils and markers or even crowns in some places. Um, part of what's great about this is this is a social annotation tool. So students can talk to each other, but you can also share out your annotations to the public. So it allows us to basically, you know, engage with people who might be part of the community or in other classes. Um, what's nice about Hypothesis is many college campuses have now added this to their learning management system like Canvas and Blackboard and Moodle. Um, and if that happens and it's attached to your learning management system, you can literally create hypothesis assignments where they show up in the learning management system, you grade them in the learning management system, um, and it, it completely integrates with your grade book so that you don't have to worry about moving between platforms when you're doing grading. Um, part of what's great about sort of substituting a digital source criticism exercise is that it doesn't require technical proficiency, right? Instead, it's really about that sort of critical thinking exercise that happens in ethnic studies classrooms. Part of what's also nice about Hypothesis is it doesn't just rely on text. So you can annotate anything that is on the web. So I have students annotate games. I have students annotate 3D objects. I have students annotate digital projects. All of those things are fodder for a source criticism exercise in your classroom that doesn't require you to do a ton of heavy lifting technically. So part of what's nice about sort of substituting in a source criticism exercise is that you can actually build those source criticism exercises together across classes. So this is um, Source Lab at the University of Illinois. Uh, uh, Russianist John Randolph runs it. Uh, basically what they do, it's a digital documentary publishing initiative they have where students are assigned a single primary source and they do research on that source and they publish about it. So they do all of the metadata, which is that information about the source. They also do commentary. They have to write about you know, the legalities of the source, the copyright of the source. Um, and part of what's really nice about this is the technical platform for this is the same for every class. Any class that's part of the University of Illinois History Department can do a source lab exercise and they can use the same technology to do the same critique. Part of what's nice about this is you're not tied to a particular type of source in terms of the content. So students have done work on topics as varied as Arctic expeditions, World War II films, the Second Anglo-Afghan War. Um, one of my favorites is actually a, a project where they've done analysis of mental hygiene product, products. Um, and what happens is at the end of the class, all of these are published and made available. And they're sort of collected as an addition to show people what's possible in sort of history. Um, and this particular set is done with um, Scalar, which is a multimodal publishing uh, platform. Scalar basically allows you to embed text and image and, and all kinds of things in together um, in a way that's relatively lightweight um, for these kinds of things. And part of what's cool about this too is I don't know how much you can see, those boxes are actually annotations. So when you click on them, you can read more about, for example, the pith helmet that he's wearing or read more about the way gender is being portrayed. Um, so that type of annotation is, is actually really, really useful. Um, and you're not limited just to text. So when you think about substituting in a source, uh, source criticism exercise in your classroom, this, for example, is uh, done by uh, Antonos Hajaraku, who is working in the Ottoman Empire and is interested in spatial networks and, and transfer of knowledge in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, his students use, this is Recogito, which is a, a tool that lets you identify and mark places in maps and texts and tables. And so basically the students take the original documentary source, 
they annotate it with the spatial information from travel logs and histories and records and all kinds of sort of contextual material that they've been studying. Um, and they put all this information into the gazetteer and it automatically populates uh, the underlying map. So part of why this type of thing is, is useful for us to think about in a digital ethnic studies class is that oftentimes we're studying people on the move, right? We're studying communities of migration, we're studying communities of transnational networks um, and having students think about place-based storytelling and place-based authority like what a gazetteer does when it says that some place is located exactly here, but we know as scholars that here is not really here so much as it might be over there and this year and over there in another year. So when you think about recogito, when you think about sort of, you know, place-based histories and, and sort of digital source criticism, you know, the big thing is you determine what the sources are. You're not limited to primary sources. You can do secondary materials, you could do photographs, you could do websites, you could do video, you could do audio files, pretty much anything that you think of as fodder for your students can become a digital source criticism exercise for the class. And for each one of these, you would have an assignment, you'd have a set of guidelines for this, uh, you'd have a rubric for grading, um, but when you add them all together, what you end up with is a number of substitutions in your syllabus that get students thinking about the digital in a way without them being overwhelmed by having to learn to code or, you know, throwing things at them that may involve too much technical work uh, for what you're trying to achieve in the classroom. Um, part of what I also like about this particular set of projects in, in the source criticism space is it allows us to really talk about over amplification of certain voices um, and narratives and geographies. Um, you know, things like why are these things being preserved in an archive versus these other things? What does it mean when there are omissions from the archive? Um, what can we learn by looking at archival holdings or, or looking at, you know, holdings of a community center and what they choose to keep around and to memorialize? Um, that's where source criticism is really great, is because it offers the opportunity for alternative stories and alternative constructions um, for people to think about. So source criticism for me is always my first go-to when I think about getting somebody started in a digital ethnic studies classroom, because almost across the board, everybody does some sort of critical thinking source exercise with whatever their raw materials are. But you're not limited when you think about substituting in some digital methods to just source criticism. You can also think about creating your own little arc of things in your course. And particularly for me, I like to think about those local resources that you have around you that you can utilize for your class. So this is one of my favorite examples. Um, Annalise Strout, I don't know if many of you know, who's at Bates College. Um, Annalise has courses for her students where they go into the special collections and archives and the public library around her university to study the university itself. So she's working on a project looking at how Bates College tells its story as an abolitionist college when in fact it, the, the founder of Bates College was very much tied to profiting from slavery. So what she does is she sends the students in and they do research with analog business ledgers, invoice, pretty much any of those documents held by the public library and the archives. And then the students create their own digital data set. So they basically digitize documents, they transcribe them, and they make that material available for analysis. So in this case, what they were learning about was that um, the cotton trade actually created a ton of wealth for Benjamin Bates, the college founder. Um, and along the way, the students learn about the context of the founding, they learn about the Atlantic slave trade, the cotton and textile trade network, and the economics of 19th century Maine. Um, for us, when we think about sort of this type of arc, what's really nice about it is one of the things that you can sort of ground your class in is the question of what does a data set look like that you find useful for your topic? So this could be, you know, ledgers of correspondence, it could be travel logs, it could be these type of economic records. And if you assemble those raw materials prior to the start of your class, those become the fodder for what you want to do throughout the entirety of the semester. 
Um, so in this case, what Annalise did is they did the work to sort of transcribe everything. They went and found the research. And then the students actually created their own digital projects using the materials that they'd gone and done research on. Um, and so she has sort of basic course goals, which are, you know, what is a data set? How does it work? Um, how does it represent the world? You know, how do we understand data as, as types of um, experiences that can be captured or not? Um, and then from there, she has these competencies that she maps those against. So, you know, do you know how to read and write in the programming language that we're teaching with? Do you know how to publish the data set the way it's supposed to be? Do you know how to document it? So for her, what she's sort of done is taken our formula of context plus method plus technical proficiency, and she's laid that out so that students basically progressively go from less complicated tasks to more complicated tasks by the end of the semester. Um, and that's a really useful sort of arc to think about. So I can show you a simple example of how this is done in a module. So this is for a databases and narratives module that I teach. Um, so I start the students with a small section of Johanna Drecker's open source textbook on databases and narratives. They then read uh, Catherine McKittrick's really great article on mathematics, black life, which highlights how black bodies are quantified in the slave trade. And then from there, they learn about how data was constructed sort of at the moment of its creation. So they read um, Ellen Garvey's Facts and Facts, which is on the abolitionist um, network and how they created an abolitionist data set in the 1840s. And they read those articles. They look at sort of the digital projects around these topics. And then they come back and they write responses for me about what they learn to critically, you know, in terms of thinking about black bodies as data, thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be counted as a person versus counted as an object? Um, and, and how do we turn people into values that can be added up versus people with experiences? Um, and for me, what this, this particular lesson plan really does for the students is it gets them thinking about how they themselves are part of a data world, right? So they think about like their smartwatches and their swipe cards and how they get counted in census, how they get counted in taxation, how they get counted in different ways. And it really pushes them to think about how the notion of data and counting and how the government requires these things reinforce structures of privilege and, and race and hierarchy that many people think disappeared with the civil rights movement. Um, and this is what it looks like in an assignment form. So um, they read Ellen Gruber Garvey's Facts and Facts, they download the little PDF, and then they write a little summary of me. And then we use that to have conversation in class. Um, and this is a really great example of how, you know, they're reading and learning about a digital method, which is quantitative methodology, but they're not actually deeply invested in digging into the method, right? They're thinking more about the human experience piece and how those experiences are transformed into data, then they're actively making the data themselves. Um, uh, and they're also, by the way, just fascinated by the notion that data is not tied to computers. Um, students are thrown by the notion that there was such a thing called data before the internet um, and, and really kind of don't know what to do when you tell them that they themselves have been data for a very long time. So, it's not just sort of, you know, what's available to you locally in your archive. It can also be fulfilling a need. Um, this is one of my favorite projects to talk about in terms of student involvement. Um, in 2012, Kelsey Corlett Rivera, who was the French subject librarian at the University of Maryland, basically went into the special collections and pulled all of their pamphlets related to um, the, the Santa Domingo, uh, Domingo grain crisis. Um, and what was happening was the university was teaching French classes and the teachers needed primary source material that the students could translate. So her strategy was to pull these French pamphlets to digitize them and the students then in their coursework did the translations. The pamphlets then came back to the team of Colony in Crisis, which was Kelsey, a graduate student uh, who was proficient in French. Um, and they basically then built editorial notes to go with them. 
So this, for example, is issue five or four. Um, they worked in Creole. Um, and what's great about Colony in Crisis is students get access to both the original French documents, but also the English translation. Um, and that allows them to do the translation work, but it also allows them to be authors of the contextual materials of how to interpret these works. Um, and this is a really successful project that's currently being used in France and Haiti and the United States um, and has a team of people behind it now that went from, you know, we're trying to solve a little problem of how to make sources available for students to translate in class to, you know, how do we actually get this raw material out there and people are using and citing this in their scholarship and in their work. Um, for those who don't have a ton of, you know, universities with libraries and archives that are really rich in sources, you also have an option like Adina Langer. Um, Adina sat down and created a, the Atlanta Rail Corridor Archive with her students. Um, she was doing and teaching a course on the history of uh, preservation in Atlanta and the ways in which transportation had enabled racial segregation in the city. And so her answer to this is, students identify a neighborhood, a business, a group, a church, a feature, an event, um, and they then go out and identify artifacts and work with the community and digitize them. And then they make those artifacts into digital exhibits. And those exhibits are made available on the website and students are allowed to then sort of publish their thinking about what's happening in the city of Atlanta um, around racial segregation and urbanization and transportation. Um, the extra credit for this class, by the way, um, she has the students who want extra credit write a grant proposal for the community that they have engaged with so that if that community needs money to go do more work on their history, they have that proposal available to them to use as raw material for a funder who might give them money to do more work. Um, and you also have options like this. So this is less institutional history of a university and more sort of on the ethnic study side. This is a project in Native American and Indigenous Studies um, from the Genoa Indian School, which was a boarding school. Um, this is a Makutu project, which is basically a digital exhibit tool where they've gone through and begun digitizing and telling the story of the boarding school students, both those who perished and those who survived. Um, and part of what I like about this project is this is a project that has built into it a consultation module with the community. So they talk to the native communities um, that they're engaged with about what it means to make that information available. Um, they use uh, the, the social human labels, um, which are labels that Alexander Dole and Mescal put together. Um, social human labels are desire, are, are ways for people who are creating content to indicate how they want their data to be used um, above and beyond the legal use, right? So part of what's great about um, social human labels as well as traditional knowledge labels is it allows communities to signal what they want in terms of access and use of their own cultural heritage. And even if you're not dealing with an indigenous community, these are labels that I really encourage you to think about adopting as you think about changing your, your teaching because allowing communities to determine for themselves what stories they want told and how they want them relayed, I think is really important for what we're doing. Um, part of what's great about Mercutu as well um, is that you can actually reserve content for certain community members. So there are user access roles where culturally sensitive content can be withheld from the general public um, and only available to certain people. Um, and part of why I like this, I often use this as examples in my classroom when students wanna talk about doing scholarship around communities that have experienced trauma, this is a really useful project to look at as a model of how do you do digital work in a way that's respectful of community desires um, and, and needs. So what about some non-local resources? What are some projects and things you can put in play in your syllabus for non-local? Um, so this is from Amanda Seligman. Um, Amanda integrates Wikipedia directly into her courses. Um, students write a short paper where they compare and contrast three Wikipedia entries with analog counterparts in specialty print encyclopedias. And then they learn all about Wikipedia and its benefits and its negatives. So as you all may know, Wikipedia has pretty problematic editorial practices. Um, there's a lot of harmful practices around evidence and documentation and authority. 
there's lots of problems around language and gender. Um, and part of why Amanda does this exercise in her class with the students is to get them to think about where people find information, right? So Wikipedia is the most cited internet resource of all time. What does it mean for her students to be contributing to uh, correcting the ills of that particular place? Um, and importantly for me, you know, I like this type of assignment because you know, there are resources from Wikipedia to help you teach the students how to do the Wikipedia editing, but there's also resources where you can get Wikipedians in residence to come into your classes and talk to students about what it means to be writing encyclopedia articles. Um, and it's, it's a pretty fun exercise when students have to live moderate things and deal with people changing their entries. And they get really, really frustrated really quickly with the notion that somebody can come up behind them and edit them and disagree with them. And so I really like this um, because students can think about the issue of objectivity and how that fits within the discourses of the classes we teach. Um, so there's other tools that are available for analysis that you can sort of think about integrating. Um, this is Voyant. Uh, Voyant is a cloud-based service where you can develop um, sort of text analysis methods. So things like word counts and modeling and graphing and all of that. Um, students don't find word clouds and, and frequency analysis that exciting, but they do like some of the other built-in tools. Uh, the screenshot you're looking at now is uh, students studying the US Civil War are looking at public sermons from Abraham Lincoln's death. Um, this is the Lincoln's logarithm project at Emory University. And they can compare and contrast the sermons. They can learn that while they were delivered on the same day, the content varied greatly. Um, and they can then construct lists of individuals and locations and other things mentioned in this. Part of what's nice about Voyant is you can upload any document that you wanna play with into it. Um, and have access to those uh, research resources with downloads um, attached to it. So it's, it's a pretty nice tool for classroom use because you don't have to teach them the math that underlies all of this unless you want to. Um, you have other options for contributing to non-local projects to think about in your classroom. Colored Conventions is a great example of this. Uh, if you're not familiar with this project, Colored Conventions documents 19th century African-American political life. Um, and they've launched a series of public transcription projects across the United States. Um, so any state with a colored convention now is being integrated into this project. This is a really great example of a project to bring into your classrooms because there's lots of different options and they've built teaching resources and teacher's guides um, that would allow you to build an entire class around it. Um, so if you're interested in oratory, if you're interested in the Civil War, if you're interested in African-American life, this is a great project to think about bringing into the classroom. Um, and this is a great team of people who will come talk to your students about what you sort of have going on. Um, and this is a crowdsourcing project, you know, so they want people to contribute as much as possible. Um, one of my favorite projects to think about for the classroom as well, um, as we move forward, is the real face of white Australia. So this is a project from Tim Sherratt um, and Kate Bagnell, where they're looking at uh, 20th century, um, artic 20th century Australian articulations of immigration, and particularly about how um, immigrants coming to Australia were determined by the records that were being kept by the government. Um, so for my class, for example, they begin a se the sequence for this particular digital project that we analyze by learning about the history of immigration in Australia, they then have to locate an immigrant record um, that meets a subset of criteria. They write an analysis of that person's life um, and basically begin to understand the experience of immigration through a single person. Um, because I teach this in a digital humanities context, um, my students also turn this into an archival question. So they have to find records in two different ways. They look at the, the state archive and try and find the same record in the state archive that they found through the Real Faces interface. Um, and for that, it's an opportunity for students to learn how much the user interfaces for archives, although things have been digitized, are not user friendly to resources and researchers doing their work. Um, and I augment this with a supplemental track where we talk about photography and issues of race and processing and representation in the cultural record. So, you know, a lot of this for me is thinking about, you know, you can bring projects into your classroom 
that are not you building things or the students building things, but are rather opportunities to introduce them to concepts and challenges in digital humanities and digital ethnic studies that allow you to still stick with your content, but bring the digital in in really useful ways. So one of my favorite examples for my American Studies students is Photogrammer. This is a project from Lauren Tilton, Laura Wexler, um, and uh, Taylor Arnold. They um, basically are mapping the works project progress administration work, the United States Farm Security photographs, all across the United States. So you can view the photographs in a roll. You can view them on a map. You can look at who, which photographs, inter, you know, photo photographers intersected with each other. Um, and part of what students really like about integrating this type of project is we can have a really interesting conversation about what images are taken in what states and how they differ. So um, I live here in Marion County, which is the dot right in the middle of Indiana. Um, and the photos for, Indi for Marion County are photos of transportation. It's African-Americans sitting in the bus transit station downtown. Whereas when they look at photographs from Mississippi, many of them are not only rural photographs, but they are rural agricultural photographs. And so it's an opportunity for us to talk about what images are taken and what instructions photographers were given and why particular narratives of black life were created by the Farm Security Administration. So let's pause for a moment. I'm, I've given you a ton of stuff so far, right? Like these are all different things that you can bring into your classroom that can offer opportunities. You know, for each person, you have to sort of identify you know, how much time and energy do you have in revising your lesson plans, revising your activities, you know, on a daily, monthly, or yearly basis? And it's one of the biggest strategies, I think, that we struggle with in digital humanities and digital ethnic studies is it takes time to revise lesson plans and activities. It takes time to stay up to speed on particular tools and technologies and methods. So one of the things that you may want to think about as you approach thinking about your syllabus is to think about it rather than just a single class, think about it as an arc of incorporating digital technology into your classes. And by that, I mean to do something like what Jessica Parr has done. So Jessica is an early Americanist. She works in colonial America and she uses Omeka across all of her classes because students can contribute material to that Omeka repository across the semesters. And what that means is she only has to, you know, sort of learn and maintain one technical infrastructure and stay up to date on that one technology. But she can also do things like customize training for her students and develop long term relationships with the communities that the students are working in. Um, and so for me, when I think about approaching my syllabus, I often think about, you know, is there a tool that I can use for the entire semester? Is there a tool that I can use for all of my introductory courses? Because it makes it a little bit easier for me as a teacher, not having to worry and test everything all the time, every other week to make sure it's still working. And that's because I don't get time to revise my syllabi. My university doesn't pay for that. <laughs> they don't pay for you know, my summertime. So when I think about remaking my syllabus, oftentimes what I'm thinking about doing is using the same tools across courses to save myself time and energy. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this, um, this is Tableau. So Tableau is a free visualization software. Um, anyone can have a free one year license to Tableau desktop. Um, any student can have access to this, including primary and secondary school, schools. Um, and what is great about Tableau is it's a drag and drop interface to creating visualizations. And literally they have a hundred different types of visualizations that you can utilize in Tableau. So this is a great example of, I invest in learning about a tool, and this is actually data from Sarah Purcell. Um, I learn and, and invest time in building Tableau, and then I can use it across all of my courses with all of my students and they can choose the different types of visualizations that are appropriate for their particular research and their particular topics and discussions. Um, the other thing I invested in and that I gave up, um, I gave up written finals, <laughs> written exams. Um, I've moved exclusively to the NSA. Um, if you're not familiar with an NSA, an NSA is basically a creative way of approaching the final assignment for a class. You can visit hashtag NSA 
Um, and this is just a sample. This is from Alexander Dukovsky of on essays that her students created. So board games, graphic novels, um, meals, poetry, digital games. One built a Sims world, a Minecraft world. Um, these are forms of creative knowledge production that you can begin to utilize in a digital space that you wouldn't necessarily utilize um, in a more analog or traditional academic environment. Same thing with things like timelines. I've invested in Timeline JS. Um, I use it for what's called a micro project. So I take one portion of a course out and I substitute in the students developing a timeline. Um, what you're looking at here is a timeline that was created for Berkeley on uh, resistance to slavery and injustice. Part of what's great about Timeline JS is the backbone for it is actually a Google um, a doc form. So it's, it's basically a Google table. Um, and students can easily put in information and it auto populates into the interface. Um, and I love this because historians talk all about time and, and time lapse. So Timeline JS is a great way. You can also think about social media and bringing social media into your classroom as one strategy for changing your syllabus. Um, a lot of scholars use Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Um, so it can be things like following a hashtag, following a scholar, following a conference. These can all be assignments in classes where students are sensitized to, you know, what does it mean when Twitter changes its algorithms? What does it mean when Facebook changes how it handles data? Um, these are all ways to sort of merge questions of content and the digital space. Um, so for example, in my African-American history course that I teach, um, I have students do analysis around the discussions of Confederate monuments. And so we learn and talk about digital platforms and how they enable conversation or don't. Um, and they follow uh, things like the Richmond monument removal um, and are part of that conversation. Um, and Jeff's on the call today. I wanted to shout out to Jeff's project. Jeff McClurkin and Ellen Holmes Pearson uh, do a similar thing where they actually are developing or have developed, sorry, a course that's co-taught across multiple semesters and actually across 11 different universities. So students get together and they do archival research. They enroll in their individual courses and they are documenting life around the Great War and the Spanish influenza epidemic. Um, and that link is to Jeff's uh, full course. This is the, the Asheville project, the Asheville University project. Um, and what's great about this is again, you know, they're passing this from course to course, they're sharing it among instructors. It's one way to, you know, lower the bar to adopting digital methods is by creating your own little cohort and sharing across courses, across universities. Um, I wanted to mention briefly two, um, two other options for inculcating new things into your courses. Uh, don't forget about sound. Um, I don't know if you spend any time looking at the National Jukebox, but this is the Library of Congress Sound Archive. Uh, students love podcasting and they love working with audio materials, remixing, um, doing all kinds of things with sound files and lecture files and things like that. Um, so podcasting is a great way to sort of ease your students into developing short form arguments in audio form. Um, so you can download any of these sources, students can play with these. Um, and what's really nice is a lot of universities support podcasting in their libraries. So you should take a look at your library locally. Um, and if not, I can point you to resources that will let you uh, sort of do the same. Um, similarly, short form documentaries. This is a short form documentary that Eliz Markowitz did in 2013 on kinder transport. Um, she basically went out and interviewed her grandmother um, and her grandmother's sister, and she turned this into a family history of her grandmother's experience on kinder transport. So again, you know, using the, the affordances of digital media to tell stories about the communities and the people that we care about are very, very important. Uh, Options are out there for all kinds of things. So this is Andrew Torgett and Caleb McDaniel's project on Texas slave ads. They digitize the slave ads. They're doing all kinds of data analysis. Again, they're using the local community and the local community's interests to sort of build courses and build digital projects around it. Um, the same thing here with David and Barris and Kate McDonald. Uh, they built a project called Body and Structures, which is all about Asian American life um, and sp specifically about Japanese empire and its spatial history. Um, this is done with Scalar as well. 
this is an example of how you know they can serve as an umbrella project. So they brought in a bunch of colleagues who wrote their own editorial sort of stances on the topic, and David and Kate basically served as editors for this. Um, and that's one option for your classes if you're teaching classes that are scaffolded in a particular way is that you could have one class creating content, another class editing it, and a third class, you know, developing the public profile for it or vice versa. Um, and I know we're running out of time. I wanted to point you guys to Twine for those of you who are thinking about games. Um, Twine is an interactive game based uh, for text. This is actually um, built by a faculty member, James Henry Morris, who built it all around Commodore Matthew Perry's visit to Japan in the 1850s. Um, students basically had to develop the storylines using primary source materials and then got to play the game uh, effectively. Uh, one final shout out to a project before we end. Uh, this is one of my favorite new projects. This is an award winning project from Vincent Brown on the slave revolt of Jamaica. Um, this is an animated thematic map, which is also an option for your class. Students basically do research, faculty do research, and they come together to create sort of one product that sort of brings things together. The important thing as we sort of end um, is that when you think about sort of taking on your course for the first time, integrating digital methods, integrating digital ethnic studies, fear of failure, I think, is something really important to recognize that you might have. Um, I get really worried about demoing new technologies in front of people. I get panic attacks about all kinds of things related to speaking publicly. Students have the same issue. And so one of the things that's important when you think about you know, changing your syllabus or incorporating digital things is to know that students can feel real pressure about failing. They feel social and personal pressure. Um, they can have anxiety about not being able to master a technology. They fear what it means to not do well in front of their peers. Um, and one of the things I want to encourage you to think about as you incorporate digital technologies is to really talk to your students before you get started about what it means when something doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. Um, I've spent years trying to learn technologies that I still cannot master, and students need to know that it's okay not to be able to do everything on the first try. Um, I try not to use the word fail with my students. Um, what I talk about is what are the limitations or what are the things we're struggling with. Um, and oftentimes when students can't complete an exercise, I have them write out exactly what they tried, what worked, what didn't. Um, and then we come back together in class and we do the exercise together so that everyone can see how to do it the way that ends up with the product we really need. Um, and that leads us to scaffolding. When you think about your curricular changes, start small, layer on more, you know, talk to colleagues who might wanna do this work with you. You're not in it alone. You've got your DEF CON mentor, you've got a network of people in the, uh, in the DEF CON program. You know, feel free to reach out to people on Twitter, on social media, um, over websites. A lot of people have a lot of teaching materials that they can sort of help you with. Um, and importantly, you know, change is ahead for this stuff. So don't try too much too soon. You know, ease yourself on in and give yourself grace as you try new things. You know, not everything's going to work the first time, and that's totally okay. We don't mind. It's okay to fail. So if you've liked anything you've heard today and don't want to just log off the call and run away from me, which is fine, um, my book comes out in May and you can have 30% off. Um, unfortunately, Duke doesn't have a pre-order system, but they do have discounts. So in May, you can log on to Duke University Press and get a 30% discount. If you cannot afford the book and you want the book, please let me know. I am happy to share under cover of darkness a PDF version. <laughs> that you can have for your own use. So that's everything from my end. I'm happy to answer questions. I know we're out of time or close to it. Thank you so much. Can we um, appreciate Jen with some kind of reaction? That was <laughs> awesome, Jen, thank you. I've um, been struggling to keep up on the, on the live tweeting, but I tried. Um, we do have about 10 minutes, because uh, we said this would go till 6.15. Uh, for questions and comments. So let's see, I'll look at the chat and see. Um, you're welcome to put a question in the chat. You're welcome to raise your hand um, with the raise your hand feature. 
Um, so I'll point you to Catherine Harris was mentioning the digital pedagogy in the humanities, which is a keywords volume, um, has all kinds of assignments and materials available for teaching purposes. So um, she's got a link there in the chat. I encourage you to check that out. Um, I actually have an article in it on project management. I think some others on this call also have articles um, and you can sort of pull those up um, as you need them. Other questions or comments, I'm happy to hear what doesn't work or what you wish to know more about, or if you have a particular problem you're encountering already, I'm happy to help problem solve with you. Feel free to unmute yourself and yell. Uh, Robert's seconding how great Twine is for the unessay style game design. Yep, no coding skills are so nice. It makes it a lot easier. Especially because we sometimes get students who think you can go from conceptualizing a game to having a, a visual game completely built in 16 weeks. That looks like, you know, something designed by a game studio. Yeah. Jen, I have a question that I think might be of interest because a lot of our, um, a lot of the people who are working with DEF CON work at universities that are focused on teaching. How have you talked about the pedagogical innovation, the teaching innovations that you've done uh, when you've yeah. gone out and you're, I know now you're working on your promotion file. So how do you talk about that uh, and make that yeah. let? Um, so I'm happy to share my dossier that I went up on for full for anyone who's gonna be going up for tenure or promotion. I'm happy to share all my materials. I'm actually getting ready to go up for full this coming year. So I have all kinds of things. Um, there's three strategies that I used in getting my teaching recognized as innovative. One was I arranged for outside assessments by colleagues in the field. So um, I contacted people who were not going to be necessarily reviewers of the dossier, but were people who taught with that method or were good researchers in a particular context. And I basically gave them access to my course and said, tell me what you think is working and what's not. So that helped tremendously getting some outside feedback as things I could include in my dossier as comments from you know, respected people in the community. Um, the second strategy is actually turning what I had done into in classes into peer reviewed scholarship. So um, scholarship of teaching and learning is one of the areas where digital humanists are still a little slow in terms of producing material. So one of the things I focused on is taking, for example, the curriculum that I designed for Introduction to Digital Humanities and writing an article about the methods and the strategies and the pedagogy that are embedded within the course. Or I just developed a new course on professional development um, for our school, and I wrote a two-part series with a colleague about how we conceptualize that course and the types of assignments and rubrics we used. The benefit to that approach where you're taking what you've already done and turning it into a secondary product is it raises the profile of that first product by driving traffic. So people who discover it in journals then are clicking the links to go back to my course stuff that's over, open and available. And that helps increase the sort of non H index kind of citation metric. Um, the final thing that I did was, and it, it sounds kind of stupid, I forced people to talk to me about teaching in my school and on my campus. So I basically began volunteering to like go talk about digital humanities to anyone who wanted to know. And I used examples from my courses when I was teaching and mentoring other people. And part of what that meant is a lot of my classes have now been picked up by other instructors and are using, they're using not just my syllabus, but like my entire learning management canvas install. And the benefit to that is I then have them write reviews of my course as a teacher after they're done teaching it. And that's helped tremendously because it raises awareness of what I'm doing in the classroom, but it also means I have examples of my pedagogy being adopted by other people. Um, so that was really useful in the tenure and promotion case because I could say so many people did this. Um, and you can submit to reviews in digital humanities for sure. We are reviewing all kinds of things. And I definitely think reviewing um, people's teaching materials would be lovely. I mean, I learn a lot. Um, I, a lot of these examples, by the way, I stole from people who publicize them on their syllabi and in articles and elsewhere. Um, and that's part of what I love about our community is that it's not really stealing. We're, we're a big borrowing collaboration community. 
That's, I love those ideas. I especially love the um, publicity tour <laughs> on campus. Um, many I mean, of us, yeah, go ahead. It sounds silly, but like our Center for Teaching and Learning is really integrated well with our sciences in that like, if you wanna talk about using a clicker in a classroom, they've got a thousand and one examples. But if, they, if you wanna talk about how to do critical source analysis in a classroom, they don't have any examples. So by going and talking to them and giving them examples from my classes, I then became one of the examples that they then used of like what humanists can do with digital methods and digital approaches. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us who have been doing this work um, institutionally have kind of had to do it our do it ourselves, right? Have to go out and introduce people to what's possible and you know get them involved and. I mean, I, I think too, like one of the approaches that I see that works really well when you're sort of that lone adopter is to present it as a, like, you know, Catherine's talking about like a manifesto, present it as a package, right? So it's not that you're changing one course, it's that you have a philosophy of your teaching that not only integrates the content that you want, but actually is really innovative in how it thinks about people learning, right? So um, I hate Bloom's taxonomy. If I could do away with it, I would. So part of when I talk about it is I talk about why I don't like higher order learning outcomes in a digital humanities classroom, right? So, you know, when you think about being that adopter, part of how you get people to come along with you is to present it as a coherent narrative of your own interest and your own sort of approach as a teacher, right? So I encourage people a lot, like even if it's just like a page, to like write out their philosophy of these things because that's something that's really useful to share with people. Thank you. Anybody else want to ask a question? You can completely disagree with me about everything I've said too. It's just wrong people. <laughs> There's a lot. I mean, I, I was struggling to um, live tweet yeah. So much, so many amazing materials. So thank you for sharing your slides because I'm sure that I'm sure everybody will be going back to them and poking around and find your book. Um, where do you recommend looking to find digital pedagogy statements? So digital pedagogy statements can show up not just in people's like dossiers that they share, but a lot of people actually have been sharing them as like links off of Twitter and social media. So if you click um, or follow the hashtag digital pedagogy, that's one place. Um, but you can also take a look at like training institutes, for example. Um, a lot of people have posted their pedagogy statements as part of their training institutes or their approaches to classrooms. Um, the other thing, Kara, you can also just reach out to somebody that you know has really interesting things to say and ask them if they have one. I'm a big fan of like the cold email of like, I love what you do, tell me more, can I have your whatever? Um, and that might be a strategy if there's particular scholars that you're interested in, like Laura Putnam, like anything Laura wants to do, I'm like, tell me all about it. How does it work, right? So thinking about reaching out directly to people. And if you adapt their material, letting them know so that they can get the benefit of that in their own promotion and tenure process. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, is, useful about about DEF CON is we're building relationships with each other and now you know us and so you know we'll get to know each other and you know if you have a mentor or you're a fellow or you are a mentor and you need anything you know this is our community um and we can be resources for each other I mean I, I'd say too like if we don't know the answer or your mentor doesn't know the answer we probably know someone who does so like Brandon just pointed out Scholars Lab at UVA has specific charters about working with students and about their pedagogy related to practice, Praxis, the Praxis program. You know, that's a great example, right? Where you could look at different digital humanity centers, you could look at scholarship labs, digital scholarship labs. You know, if, if you don't know where it is, we can help you find it. Um, and you'll never turn anybody off um, by asking where does something come from or do you know who has it? Absolutely. Brandon needs to write his own digital pedagogy statement. We'll put that on his to-do list. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us to kick off our 
speaker series. It was so wonderful to, to see all of you. We hope you'll join us um, at future events and to just be in touch. And, you know, um, I, for one, would love to know, you know, what you need as we're, so I can take it back to our steering committee as we're planning uh, what we can do um, over the next couple of years. So let us know. Thank you.